Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Scott Barrett. Like you heard, I'm a test engineer for Bobcat. Um, so today, I'll be talking to you about the damage editing of field duty cycle data for a lab fatigue test without direct strain gauge data. Yeah, mouthful. And then, I mean, I've got an additional long technical sounding subtitle as well. So a little bit about um, Bobcat and then myself. So right off of our company website, Bobcat's a worldwide leader in the manufacturing of compact equipment for a lot of different markets, construction, rental, landscaping, utilities, mining, grounds, maintenance, ag. Uh, personally, I'm a test engineer focused uh, now mainly in the structures of loaders, sometimes excavators. And uh, so I'll, I'll collect uh, both lab and field data, um, strain gauge performance data, things like that, and also set up and run lab fatigue and uh, durability tests. So the uh, challenge that was given to me was I needed to develop uh, a lab durability test for a specific component of the uh, skid steer loader undercarriage. So I needed to use uh, field duty cycle data that had already been collected to create uh, a time compressed or a damage edited, and I'm going to use those two terms kind of interchangeably here, uh, lab test. So, you know, the ideal situation would be you have the test defined and then you, you know, go out and collect the field duty cycle data. Well, we didn't have that luxury here, so we had to work off what data was available. Um, the, uh, I guess, that's showing up, there we go. The uh, area of concern was around our hydraulic drive motor uh, where it bolts up to the transmission. Um, we were concerned about that joint. We didn't have a strain gauge in that location that would give us good correlation. What we did have is um, axle torque on all four axles. By, uh, we had all four axles strain gauged to measure axle torque. So what my goal then became was I needed to develop this lab test based on drive motor torque uh, as measured by those strain gauged axles. So I'll, I'll give you a little background into maybe the physics of, of how the uh, skid steer loader works. So we've got uh, a drive motor, a uh, hydraulic drive motor on each side to drive the left and right hand side. That's connected by uh, chain and sprocket to both the front and the rear axle. So you've got you know, a single drive motor that can produce a, a set amount of torque based on its displacement and pressure you give to it. So that has to be split between the front and rear axle. Now, you know, how much uh, torque you get at each axle is going to be dependent on the loading conditions of the, you know, of the machine. Now, if you're, say, digging into the pile, you know, and you've got uh, the back end basically off of the ground, you're going to have all that torque in your front axle and almost none in your rear. Um, and since we're looking at it, this is, so this is actually the, the fatigue test setup. So we had the skid steer transmission and then bolted to the hub um, we had just this lever arm, and that was connected to uh, the servo-driven actuator, you can see with the load cell and uh, built-in LVDT there. So we had one of these you know, actuators connected to each axle, and the uh, drive motor was actually locked. We, f we filled it full of weld to prevent it from rotating so that all of our uh, loads were reacted right at the drive motor. So. How did I, uh, how was ENCODE integrated as a solution to this problem? Well, the damage editing glyph was kind of the meat and potatoes of this whole thing. Um, it allows you to remove any non-damaging events uh, from your, you know, field data. And by doing that, you know, you greatly reduce the, the required test time. Um, and the added value of, of doing this, I was able to go in and, and, you know, change some parameters, change some settings that I'll, I'll talk to a little bit more later and, uh, you know, quickly evaluate how those changes were going to affect uh, the damage realized by these components. So that's just a snapshot of uh, the flow that I used in order to, to do this. So effects of damage editing or, or time compression, like I said, it removes time slices that don't induce any damage into the component or minimal damage into the component. So you put in, you know, a you want to maintain a specified percent of damage of the original data. So you say you want to keep 90% of the original data, or the original damage. So I've got two traces here, the edited data and the original data. And they're on the same uh, magnitude scale and time scale here. So you can kind of see, you know, the, uh, the original data will have, uh, you know, a large uh, event here and here. So maybe 10, 15 seconds between them. And in between that time, you know, we really might not have anything going on. 
whereas the uh, edited data, so the data that will be playing into the test rig, you know, we've got all the events kind of right one after another. Um, so the big part of this, especially for this test, is that you can use multiple channels, so front and rear axle, and analyze them at the same time. And that keeps the channels in phase. So this is really important for this test because we've got you know, a set amount of torque that the drive motor can produce, and we're, we've got two different axles that are, that are using it. So if we were to maybe set up like a, just a block cycle test, you know, we might um, get some interactions if you didn't have it set up correctly where you were actually um, inducing some unrealistic loads into the loader that uh, you were not going to see in the field. So damage editing without strain gauges. So this is where um, we had to use a little creativity. So since we didn't have a, a good strain gauge to work off of, because the damage editing glyph requires a, a damage time series input, so the, basically the output from a stress life or a strain life glyph, um, we had to find another way to, uh, to use this. So since torque is linearly related to stress, what I did was use the scalar factor to you know, reduce the torque time series magnitudes to something that you typically see from a strain gauge. So say we've got 2,500 foot-pounds of torque out of that axle, you, you know, apply that scalar and, and maybe that's a 25 KSI, something like that. So you're not targeting you know, a specific um, area technically, you know, you're not trying to derive the stress at a specific point on the, on the uh, subject, you're just trying to scale the data so that it's something that we can use in that uh, damage editing glyph. Um, the real, the real uh, trick here though is that you know, you've really got to take time and think through you know, what that scalar factor should be, what those magnitudes should be in order to give you um, a value that's realistic. You know, if you're over predicting damage, you're going to get a really short test length, right? And you're going to play that back in your test rig, and you might not find it, you know, you might not have any failures in your test rig, which would lead you to think that you've got a, a durable component when, you know, you might actually not. And then on the flip side of that, if you under predict damage, you're going to get this really long test, and you're going to have uh, failures that you think are premature. So you're going to end up over designing your component, which is also. Uh, you know, not something that you want to do for the cost aspect of it. And along with that, you know, you, you've got to choose a reasonable material from the library for the location of your expected failure. So if you're expecting failure at maybe an F weld or at, uh, you know, a parent material, maybe a grade 36 deal with, you know, a certain notch factor, those are all things that you've, you've got to take into account and uh, really think through to make sure that you're you're uh, doing something here that's not way out to lunch. Once the data is damage edited, what I did was just converted it back to torque using that same uh, scalar factor. And then from there, converted it to force based on the test rig design, so the length of that, uh, that arm that I showed you earlier. So that's the, I guess, theoretical side. Now I'll hop back to reality here. Um, all of the data that we collected was that like 200 hertz. Well, you know, we're using hydraulic actuators, so that limits your test rig to 50 hertz. We're using, um, like I said, uh, the connecting link between the drive motor and the axles is a chain and sprocket, so you've got a lot of, you know, chain slop in there, and that also limits the test rig's ability to actually reproduce um, some of this frequency content. So, um, uh, I guess another reality of, of all testing is uh, the test timeline that we were given. You know, that, that uh, shortened timeline actually, you know, gave us the opportunity to kind of look at some of the old methods that we'd been doing, like block cycle testing, and, uh, you know, deploy some of these new methods um, that are now available to us with uh, ENCODE GlyphWorks. And one of the uh, most useful ones that I've found, besides damage editing, is the super looping glyph. Um, it allows you to really uh, you know, put in a, a set, you know, a number of values or um, I guess um, uh, multiple values for a different setting of each glyph and it'll automatically play through and you can see, you know, how much, uh, how much your, your uh, you know, calculated values change then based on those settings. So 
for like say the uh, low pass filter that I used to take our you know um, 200 hertz data down to what the test rate can do you know I did it at 5 10 20 30 hertz just to see what kind of effect that would have on the amount of damage retained and and it turned out I used like 9 hertz was my final setting and I only lost maybe 3% of the damage as compared to uh, calculating at 200 hertz so you know that's within the variability of going out and collecting this data again with the machine um, and it also allowed me to optimize the damage editing glyph so you can adjust things like the window setting or the window length to uh, you know shorten the uh, time slice that that it takes out of that original data trace to give you a, a shorter or longer test length so I evaluated all these settings on the different uh, field duty cycles that we were going to be playing back uh, through the test rig and then um, finally used ENCODE to generate the RPC3 files that would play into the uh, RPC Pro software that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So the big uh, selling point here is that you know what we're playing back into the test rig are actual field loads that we measured you know with the machine. So you know it makes uh, the calculation of our acceleration factor actually pretty straightforward. So if we've got you know um, say three hours of field data and we've shortened it down to 10 minutes in the in the test rig it gives us an AF of about 18. Um, this is you know really preferable to block cycle testing for a couple reasons. Um, you know we're we're making sure that uh, you know with the channels being kept in phase that we're not introducing any um, odd or or impossible loading basically into the specimen. And also when you look at your rain flow diagram. You know, when you do block cycle counting, you might pick out five or eight, you know, different, uh, different loads and, you know, just keep repeating those. So you're just getting kind of a small spectrum of that uh, rain flow. Whereas when you're doing it like this, you're getting a much bigger, bigger portion of that rain flow diagram playing back into your, into your test rig. So the final outcome of this, you know, Glyphworks made it possible to quickly analyze this data and uh, create an optimized, I shouldn't say drive file, but uh, desired data to make sure that our product was validated on time, on schedule. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you.